This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, part of the Seneca Network from the China Project. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, and gaslighting isn't real. And if you think otherwise, you're crazy. My co-host is John Pazin, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and the moment she accepted his check, John knew his psychic was no good. There's a lot of advice out there about how to learn Chinese. John and I are going to talk about 10 of the worst pieces of advice about learning Chinese so you can know what to look out for. Interview is with Steve Kaufman, legendary polyglot and speaker of 20 languages, including Chinese. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. Hey everybody, my name is John Pasden. I live in Shanghai, China. How's it going? All right, John, gearing up for the Golden Week here in China. That's the Guoqingjie, right? You mean here in China, not there in China. Ah, oh, there in China. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, China is about to have its uh, its uh, National Day holiday, a whole week. Um, they call it a week, but then they make you work on the weekend right after. But anyway, yeah, it's our holiday. So, and in fact, when this episode drops, it'll be right in the middle of it. Uh, it ranges from October 1st to October 7th, so it's a, a good time for a vacation. But you're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff, aren't you, John? Yeah, not traveling. Uh, COVID is still a thing in China, still a thing. Um, but yeah, we'll be okay. We'll, we'll get lots of uh, interesting things done, I guess. I guess. Well, in the meantime, John, we do have a listener review. Uh, let's Hopefully we can make sense of this. It says, good background chat. Okay. Enjoying this as an addition to Duolingo and Hello Chinese. I'm not very serious learning of Chinese. Relaxed and informative. Good to have lots of backlists to enjoy. From Sl via Apple Podcasts in Great Britain. Okay. Thanks. Uh, um, thank you for that review. We appreciate it. Thank you. We welcome more reviews. Uh, we're happy to get them. And uh, we welcome any questions and feedback. Okay, John, today we are talking about the 10 worst pieces of advice about learning Chinese. Oh, man, there's there's so much bad advice out there because, you know, Chinese just feels like such an exceptional language. So it's like any advice goes because it's Chinese. Absolutely. And we see stuff around floating around out there on Reddit, on blog posts, social media, whatever. I mean, there's just all sorts of uh, a lot of traditional ideas, but uh, but just some straight-up bad advice out there. All right, so let me kick it off. We have 10 things we want to talk about, and the one thing that I hear the most that really annoys me because it's just so blatantly false is this advice that, oh, you don't need to worry about tones, especially to beginners. And while it's true that maybe you can listen to them more before you spend too much time trying to perfect them, you do have to worry about tones. And then there's another there's another version of this that you hear intermediate learners sometimes say who have been studying tones for a while and they're getting kind of sick of them. They're like, well, if you just speak really fast, then it, the tones go away and it just doesn't matter. Yeah, that, <laughs> just, that's not accurate. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. Uh, I, I love that faster thing, you know, like, oh, just speak real fast because, you know, that's how native speakers speak and they don't really pronounce the tones and they just, you can just kind of slough them off, right? It's like, yeah, they do pronounce the tones. They, they kind of give them different emphasis when they speed up, but that's like... High level Chinese, that's like, you know, turbo Chinese. And it's not uh, just speaking fast and throwing the tones out the window. Now, on that note, though, John, I do remember reading an article on your blog forever ago. It was something about this. And if I recall, you're going to need to refresh my memory on this, but it was like you actually recorded some native speakers speaking quickly. And what you found was like, as long as you hit like kind of the main tones, like or like on the most emphasized words or something like that, that's how it kind of came across. Was it something like that? Yeah, that wasn't my research. I was uh, I was citing research from another professor at Actful years ago. But yeah, it's uh, when people speak fast, they emphasize certain tones, and those tones come across more clearly. Um, but it's not that the other tones are just gone; they're just de-emphasized. Gotcha. So yeah. Overall, do focus on tones. 
Uh, and I, I, one advice about this, I, I always liked that someone gave me was, hey, focus on 100% accuracy because you won't get it. And if you try over 100%, maybe you'll get 80 and that'll be good enough. <laughs> That's not bad. Okay, Jared, you got another one? All right. Number two here says, don't worry about characters. Just learn pinyin. Yeah, it's just right in line with number one. Uh, characters, hey, yeah, they're too hard. You know, all you need to worry about is just speaking Chinese. Uh, so just focus on learning pinyin, and you can type that out. Uh, and yeah, don't don't do this. Don't do this. So um, okay, this this kind of holds over a little bit uh, from some advice saying okay at the beginning, don't worry so much about characters. Do learn pinyin, but that doesn't mean totally ignore characters and never learn them. Yeah, and actually, I think this goes back to um, some scholars' ideas from, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, about how the Chinese language is going to evolve and characters are going to go away. But the Chinese have kind of made their opinion clear on this. They're not getting rid of their characters. They like their characters. And they they consider them a central part of Chinese culture. So um, if you want to get to an advanced level of Chinese or even an intermediate level, you can't ignore the characters. But yes, do focus on pinyin and good pronunciation in the beginning. I do have a story about this. Back in Shanghai, I had a friend who was learning Chinese and was following this exact mindset. He was not learning characters. He was just learning pinyin. And he started sending me text messages in pinyin. And I'm telling you, John, it was like the hardest thing. I'm like, what? I mean, it, it took way longer for me to read. I Maybe if I was used to it, I, it would have been a little quicker, uh, as opposed to reading characters. So he was sending me text messages in pinyin. And I was replying in characters, and it was just, it was a mess. Uh, so yeah, don't do that. And the other piece of advice I give people about this is like, okay, at the beginning, like learning characters, it is a little slower. It feels like it slows you down, but promise you, once you get to, um, you know, get into it a little bit further, it actually accelerates your learning. And I also want to mention that I know a guy who got to a pretty high level of Chinese learning no characters. Mm -hmm. And he did get to a point where he felt like he just couldn't retain new vocabulary because everything sounded so similar. And he had no way of differentiating all all the homophones. And if you have characters and you can see the characters and and link it with other words, you know, you you can kind of form connections. It's like he was building a castle out of sand and that can only get so high, right? So the characters really do help you form connections in your mind. It helps you understand new words without having to look them up. And it helps you understand all the words you already know. So let's see how far illiteracy gets you in today's society. All right, number three, John. Okay, so one I've heard is all you need is a good textbook. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think I think if this is true at all, it's the truest in the beginning. Like in the beginning, all the most basic Chinese, you know, it's it's all pretty similar um, and so a good textbook is going to have it all. But part of the problem here is like, what's a good textbook? Um, I've mentioned before that I used integrated Chinese way back in the day, and it's a pretty solid textbook for sure. But just as recent as when I used to work at Chinese Pod, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, a little over 10 years ago, um, so many people found Chinese Pod so refreshing because it had like the modern language that textbooks didn't even have at the time. And it's definitely good to have multiple resources. Textbooks are useful for sure. But um, once you get beyond the very basics, it's nice to branch out a little bit. Definitely. You know, and I did start with a textbook. But yeah, it's definitely not going to get you all the way. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that might be all that they spend their time in in learning. That's, That's their sole learning resource. We do talk about this one in depth. In episode number 27, it's called, Can You Learn Chinese from a Textbook? So that, that's actually a good reference. But I think it's important to note that textbooks are excellent at introducing language, but they're not good at recycling. So this is a, and this is a very important aspect of really building fluency in a language. So, okay, great. Yeah, you learned something. Maybe you saw it once or twice and you remember it right then. But are you going to remember that days, weeks, months down the road? Not unless you use it again. So that's one of the shortcomings of textbooks. Uh, they're, they're really helpful, but if that's all you're using, good luck. Well said. Okay, number four. Being able to read the news is your goal, reason, purpose for learning Chinese. Okay, this is challenging. We've talked a lot about learning to read the news on this podcast before. And overall, it is just not a good goal. Well, some people might 
really be into the news. So I, we don't want to forget about those people. I, I know people, they want to go into, you know, policy and politics and all this stuff where being able to read the news is central to their career. But that's not most people. Definitely. And and this is something I, we go back, we, we talked about this before, saying, hey, you want to learn to read the news in Chinese? Well, do you even read the news in English? All right. Do you what do you actually like to read? Um, are you aware of what the Chinese news is like? Um, is it going to covering things that you want to read? And uh, usually when you bring up these questions to someone who's made this type of goal, uh, they're a little unclear about that or there might be a lot of no's in responses to those questions. Yeah, so being able to read the news is not the only high-level goal. There are other things you can do that are more in line with your actual interests and your real goals. Okay, so number five, just learn more vocabulary, whether it's word lists or flashcards or memorizing the dictionary. More vocabulary, that's all you need. Okay, so obviously vocabulary is one thing you need for learning Chinese, but just lists and lists of vocabulary isn't going to help you build fluency. If you don't practice talking to people, you're not going to be good at having conversations. Sorry if that seems obvious, but there are a lot of people that put way too much focus solely on vocabulary. Another good story on this. I recall uh, when meeting this guy, this Chinese guy back in Shanghai, and he had been learning English in school for a long time. And his method for learning English was to study the dictionary. And unfortunately, this is, I mean, it sounds a little bit ridiculous when you say it out loud, but it's unfortunately all too common. And guess how good his English conversational level was? Dictionary-tastic? <laughs> good description. Well, it pretty much didn't exist. He really couldn't speak English at all. It was just kind of words here and there. Uh, but this this is a real common thing. is just constantly acquiring knowledge, but there's that balance between knowledge and proficiency. So uh, even if you're just flashcarding yourself to death, studying word lists and things like that, that doesn't mean that you're going to know how to use it. And the good news is, Jared, I think not nearly as many people try to learn English by studying a dictionary nowadays, but it did used to be fairly common. So just think about it that way. Constantly acquiring new vocabulary without actually learning to use it is probably the equivalent to just trying to study the dictionary. Uh, there's, there's not going to be a lot of difference in that. And, and, it's, and one of my favorite analogies is like, you couldn't just read a book on how to play guitar and then just be able to play guitar. No, you actually got to be able to use that. All right, so number six, just watch movies or TV shows or videos in Chinese and you'll learn Chinese that way. Oh, man. Okay, uh, this rolls back to a, a key underlying principle for all language learning, and that is comprehensible input. Right, so especially in the beginning, um, it's going to be very hard to find movies, TV shows, uh, or many videos that are actually comprehensible. I mean, there are some on YouTube, like we talked about one last week, right, which are super simple for beginners. But in general, if you're looking for native level movies and TV shows, that's something you're going to want to wait a while before you really try to tackle. Um, there's a lot more simple things that will be more comprehensible that you can tackle in the beginning. And uh, there's plenty of time to try to find movies and TV shows later. Definitely. So a lot of this time you're going to be listening. I mean, maybe you have subtitles on, right? Uh, but if you have subtitles in English, you're just going to be focusing on those. Maybe you start picking up a word here and there, but when you're listening to something or watching something and you're like at 10% comprehension, heck, 50%, even 80% comprehension, it's just not good enough to fully grasp what's going on. Now, if you are at that higher level of comprehension, you will start picking up maybe some words and phrases here and there. But, I mean, the research is just compelling uh, on this area. If you're not listening at a high level of comprehension, your ability to actually learn from that is not going to be that great. Uh, you might, Like I said, you might pick up some small things here and there, but if you're using that, and I think also it's good to contrast this, John, right, is with the time that you're using. If this is something that's just in the background, like something that's just playing as you're doing other things, okay, that's not like eating into your study time. But if you're using that as like your sole focus to learn and to study from, ah, you're going to give them a lot more progress by using some other methods. Yeah, so I know plenty of people that like to put on Chinese music they don't fully understand or play Chinese movies. And that's fine because they're not expecting to start busting out with fluent 
sentences from those, right? They're just kind of they're just kind of enjoying hearing the sounds of Chinese, the rhythm, getting more used to it, right? But it's not what they're focused on fully comprehending or producing. So comprehensible input, that's one of the big barriers on this. Definitely great when you're higher level, but man, when you're just starting to learn or you beginner, elementary, intermediate, nah, probably not, probably not the best stuff. All right, next up is number seven. Immersion is the only way to learn. Yeah, that's uh, fortunately false because it's not the best time to do immersion in China uh, these past few years with COVID. But um, sure, immersion is great and immersion will really kickstart your learning, but it is not the only way to learn. And there are tons of people, I've met many of them, come to China for the first time already speaking pretty darn fluent Chinese. It is possible. I hope that's something that a lot of our listeners have picked up from this podcast and when they're listening to people's interviews, how many people have not been to China and have achieved a high level of Chinese. So immersion, it's great when you can get it. Uh, But even so, John, like a beginner just throwing them into an immersive environment, that doesn't mean they're automatically just going to start learning, right? Uh, When I go back to what I was just saying before, comprehensible input, that's one of the challenges of sometimes going straight into an immersion environment. You have no idea what's going on. And unless you have someone who can help, like maybe speak down to your level, help you along, teach you and study along the way, uh, immersion can actually be a little bit slower. Okay, so in general, immersion is very helpful, but given the right circumstances, it could be, you know, not the best way to learn Chinese if you're in a bad situation. Okay, so you, thanks for that, John, because it's not as said that it's always going to be slower, right? Uh, at the beginning, it's been probably more challenging, and a lot of people may not won't be willing to stick with it. Uh, but immersion's great if you can get it. But I guess the point is, is that it's not the only way to learn, right? A great episode I remember was in episode number eight, Dylan Jaggery, who achieved a high level of Chinese without ever having stepped foot in China. He just uh, really immersed he created, I guess, his own immersion environment, but he really focused a lot of his time and studies on learning Chinese in many, very, very many creative ways that really helped him to attain a high level of fluency. Okay, number eight, you have to handwrite to learn characters. Oh, no. Oh, man. This is uh, unfortunately all too pervasive. Uh, I just remember seeing something on Reddit recently. Someone had a picture of all the notebooks that they had filled up writing characters. And I mean, these weren't like those small little Chinese writing character notebooks. These were like full, full college ruled notebooks with like hundreds of pages in them. And he had something like 15, I don't know. It was, there was a lot of notebooks and people were upvoting and say, Oh wow, that's amazing. That's great. And I will say, yeah, that's amazing. You did that much. That's great. But no, this is not a good example. You don't have to do that to learn characters. Yeah, when people ask me if they have to learn to handwrite characters, if they want to learn characters, I always recommend that they learn to handwrite some so they're familiar with the basics of writing. But to just feel like you have to write every new character you learn, you know, dozens or hundreds of times, um, sorry, you don't have to do that. Um, It's true that even kids in China nowadays do write characters over and over quite a bit. But um, the world is changing. And uh, Chinese adults are forgetting how to write the characters that they wrote so many hundreds of times as kids because they just type on their phones and on their computers and they don't handwrite themselves that much. It's important to recognize that handwriting characters is a skill in and of itself. And it takes a lot of practice to be able to write fluently, handwrite fluently. And it takes a lot of practice to keep that skill up, just as you're noting. These uh, people that call it character amnesia. It's a normal thing, right? And a question I get once in a while is like, well, how can you know a character but not know how to handwrite it? And I say, it's the same way that you could read a word and not remember how to write it. So like tintinabulation or automatopoeia, right? Can you spell those? No, but if you saw it, you could read it. Right. Spelling is easy to forget. And we actually have a podcast um, on a study that was done with different groups of learners, some who are learning to write characters by hand and some who are just learning by typing. And that also produced very encouraging results that tell us that you really don't have to write that much by hand. My final note on this is that 
comparing that story that I shared at the very beginning of this point here of that person who filled up all these notebooks with uh, you know Chinese characters and they learned to read and write Chinese that way, great. For every one person like this, there's probably a, a hundred, hundreds, maybe a thousand that gave up uh, because they thought maybe learning was was too hard, learning characters was too hard, so they just gave up. So those are outliers. Uh, and if you love characters and that's just like your passion and you love want to learn to handwriting, sure, go for it. I mean, that, that's great. But for the average, for the most normal people, it, it yeah, don't worry about that. Okay, number nine, learn to read with kids' books that have characters with pinion over them. Okay, so this one's actually a double whammy because there's the kids' books thing and then there's the, the pinion over the characters. So first of all, Chinese kids' books are surprisingly difficult um, they're not so much designed for enjoyment and more to like cram vocabulary into to these poor little kids' brains. Um, and so they're not as helpful as you might think just because they're kids' books. Um, but then the other thing is those those characters with opinion over them, you're going to have a hard time ignoring that pinion and reading the characters. Oh, man, th- this, this subject's so deep. Uh, <laughs> a lot to unpack on this one. But, you know, one point I make about kids' books is that really all these kids' books in Chinese that you might say, hey, these might be suitable for me. Think about it. Is a kid reading those themselves? No. These are read-aloud books. These are books that parents or adults will read to children, and children don't read them themselves. So they can understand what's being read, but they're not reading it themselves. So keep that in mind at the beginning that, yeah, they're, they're not written for you. And and that pinion over the text, oh, man, yeah. It's like you, you can't not look at it. And this is a bit challenging sometimes to explain to a Chinese teacher because for them, just the Chinese characters are so natural. And they're just like, well, yeah, I can just read the characters without looking at the pinion. But for us, you know, who've grown up with the alphabet, uh, it's like almost impossible not to look at. Uh, it's just they're, they're, our eyes are drawn to like it's like a tractor beam, you know. You can't not look at it. And you can cover up the pinion, but it's better if it's just not there. And if it's a kid's book, then it's still going to be super hard without the pinion. Um, wh- one one comment on the kids' books um, is that the culture for children's books really is different in, for example, China and the USA. So in the U.S., a lot of people try really hard to instill a love of reading and they will make the books as simple and as entertaining as possible so kids just read more. Um, you know, you got Die of a Wimpy Kid, you got Dog Man, you, you, got, you got all these books that kids just love. Piggy and Gerald, love that series. Mm-hmm. And China's a little different. I mean, they want their kids to enjoy reading, but they also don't want to pass up the opportunity to, uh, to give them all this great vocabulary and, and you know, uh, characters and Cheng Yu and, and all, all this stuff. Um, so it's just a very different culture. And the result for us learners is often that it's very hard to find a kid's book that we can actually read. So don't focus on reading these because they're not written for you. I mean, they're, they're not written for L2 Chinese learners. They're written for L1 Chinese learners. And if you're high enough level to read them, okay, sure, fine. That's, that's cool. But uh, they're in general, for most learners, and they're not the best learning language. They're not the best language learning materials. But but if if you just want to look, open up a book, try to read a page or two. If you can't get through a page or two, then that's probably a sign. All right, number ten, our last one. Just use this app or program or book or method, and you'll be fluent. Ah, oh, yes. Marketing at its finest here. So there's a lot of ways to learn a language, and they all can work, but some are more effective than others. Um, But what I do see is that if you're sticking solely to just one method, one app, one book, you are not going to get the exposure to the language and the usage of the language that you really need to become, quote-unquote, fluent. I try to avoid that F word, but there it goes. Yeah, and really, the further you go with your Chinese studies, the more you're going to feel the need to personalize your own studies. This is something that I focus at at my other company, All Set Learning. You really got to be personalizing your studies so that it stays interesting, so that you're finding what works best for you and concentrating on that. And um, I don't think there's any single app that is going to cover 
everyone's needs, even if it's an app that's really well suited to you. So don't feel weird if you hate Duolingo and your friend loves it, or um, you know most people like Pleco, but maybe you don't. Um, that's totally fine. But you probably have a sort of whole portfolio of tools and materials that you like for learning Chinese, and that's cool. And if you've devoted all this time, hopefully you are building out this whole you know repertoire that you can focus on as you extend your studies. So feel free to switch things up. And you know you may say, hey, you've got this app or program or book or method. Well, use them all. And also find some way to use your language to someone to talk to or someone to type to or text to, something like that, where you actually get to be able to make that language relevant and useful to you in your life. And uh, you'll see more progress that way than if you just stick to one thing. Oh, and Jared, there's one honorable mention for worst advice for learning Chinese. Our John. Especially when it comes to like a single resource that someone focuses on. Well, it couldn't be something that's too popular, is it? I'm talking about Chinesey, Jared. Chinesey. Oh, so, but, but, um, it's, but Chineseys taught me that all characters look like pictograms, like what they represent, right? <laughs> yeah, so Chinesey, it looks good. Um, if it if it gets you into Chinese, that's fine, but um, it's a bit simplistic because it's not like a, a system for learning Chinese. Um, we're not going to say too much about that here, but uh, trust us on this one. Great thing about Chinesey, I mean, it's... It, it gets a lot of people interested in learning Chinese. It's awesome, and it is kind of fun. Uh, it's a great book to like put on your coffee table. As far as a serious language learning resource, um, there there are some probably better methods out there, but uh, but it, it, there's definitely some things in there that might be able to help you remember some of those characters. Jared, do you like Chinese? It sounds like you're kind of into it, man. Well, you know, I mean, Chinese. No, I'm not into it. Yeah, it's okay for maybe the first 20 characters, maybe even 50, but um, yeah, it's not systematic. Um, you need to go deeper than that. Okay, so that is our list. So hopefully after listening to this, you've been aware now of some bad advice you may have received, and hopefully you can make some course corrections. It's not too late. And if you have other bad advice and you'd like to share it with us or ask us if something is bad advice, please get in touch. We're happy to hear it, and don't forget, you can learn Chinese. Definitely. You can learn Chinese. All right, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is Mandarin Companion, Chinese graded readers. Today we are talking about Country of the Blind is a classic short story by H.G. Wells that has been adapted into a unique Chinese graded reader. Okay, so this is a story about an explorer who finds this community which is secluded within this mountain range. And uh, not only are they secluded, but these are a whole group of people that cannot see at all. In fact, they are not even familiar with the concept of sight. Some genetic disease has wiped that out over generations, and so they don't even know what that means. So he says to himself, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. But things don't quite turn out the way he expects. Yeah, so it's an interesting uh, parable with regards to, uh, you know, feelings of cultural superiority. Uh, maybe you don't take the metaphor too far because uh, it's also just a, a cool little story. Uh, but I think you'll enjoy it. A lot, of our, uh, a lot of our readers really like this one. So that's The Country of the Blind. It's a Manor Companion level one graded reader using only 300 basic characters. You can go out and get it today on Kobo, iBooks, Amazon, or other places. Enjoy. All right, now it's time for rants and raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? I guess you could call it a rave. This is a linguistic rave. Um, it's about a feature of Chinese pronunciation, which is especially prominent in northern China. It is known as arhua. So it's that, mm. that rrr sound that you often hear at the end of syllables. And um, it's, it's the reason that people say Beijingers sound like pirates. And um, you don't hear it so much in the <laughs> South. You don't hear it in Shanghai, where I live. 
Um, it's also something that's kind of hard to understand. Like, when do you add it? When do you have to add it? But when can you add it? Um, it's a little tricky, but it adds such a distinctive uh, feel to Beijing Mandarin that um, I really do like it, even though I don't use it much myself because I, I identify with Shanghai. Um, but I remember, like, years ago when I was visiting friends in Beijing, um, I was meeting up with uh, Jeremy Goldcorn, who's actually oh, at the China Project, yeah, Seneca, and we were talking about it. And he was like, but there are some words that you just have to add the R. And I was like, what? What do you mean? He's like, well, like the, the verb for to play. You can't say one. It has to be war. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, it does sound better as war, doesn't it? Even though in Shanghai, all we say is one. Um, so anyway, I, I just thought I'd, I'd uh, give this little thumbs up to this particular feature of Beijing Mandarin. It is pretty fun. Okay, so Jared, do you have a rant or rave? John, I have a rave today. Uh, and this was a personal experience that just happened a few days ago here in the States. Um, my wife and I were out uh, shopping for some uh, home improvement materials. We stopped at a little ramen shop to get some food. And the owner of this place was a uh, Chinese. And so we started talking with her. Uh, and that's not my rave, though. But her employee was there. She was an American girl. And uh, she I, and I said, well, do you, do you understand anything we're saying? She's like, actually, I can pick up a little bit. And she was like, uh, I'm, I'm like, oh, you can. She's like, yeah, I've, I've been learning some Chinese and I've been learning some Korean. And, and I was like, oh, hey, that's really cool. And and so we got talking a little bit, and then I said, hey, well, you know, maybe you might want to, uh, you know, we have a podcast actually about learning Chinese. And she's like, oh, you do? And and so I said, she said, what is it? And so I, I told her, so, you can learn Chinese. And she's like, oh, wait, that's your podcast? And uh, it was pretty cool. I met a podcast listener in the wild. Uh, it was at a little noodle shop in Logan, Utah, which is not a large town. Uh, and so that, that was really fun. So I'm going to give a shout out to Abby. Uh, we, we actually met in person and hopefully one of these days, I'm, I'm, have John, have you met a, a podcast listener in the wild out there somewhere? Uh, you mean this podcast? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have actually. I, I think there are more of them okay. in China. Yeah. I met a number of them. I, I perhaps it's pretty cool. Perhaps, yeah. There, there's, there's going to be more in Shanghai there for you. Definitely. But that was my first time actually meeting someone out just, to, like I said, in the wild who'd, who'd uh, just randomly ran across them and they, they listened to our podcast. And she's like, I thought your voice sounded familiar. I'm like, well, okay, there we go. Um, but anyway, so I thought that was pretty fun, which makes me think, John, maybe we should have a listener meetup sometime. All right. Party at Jared's house. This interview was first aired on July 29th, 2019, and it's as good as the day we recorded it. Steve is an amazing guy, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Jared, I'm uh, very happy at any time to discuss learning Chinese. It's a subject uh, that I'm fascinated by, and it was major influence on my life. That's Steve Kaufman. If you haven't heard of him before, you have now. I'm a grandpa, 73 years old, live in Vancouver. Right now, I'm involved with my son in a project called Link, which is a language learning platform. But for most of my life, I was in the lumber business. Throughout my professional life, I've had reason to learn various languages. Learn various languages might be a bit of an understatement. So how many languages does he speak? Well, you know, I have varying sort of levels of proficiency and call it 20, but 10 of or 11 of them I could jump right into and hold a conversation in, and uh, the others would take a bit more <laughs> warming up or improving before I could do that. Steve's not only a great guy, but a great example of how interest and discipline can be focused to learn any language. Talking with Steve helped me expand my view beyond Chinese fluency and recognize that there are infinite horizons to explore. This is an interview you won't want to miss. Stay with us. Well, Steve, okay, start at the beginning then. I want to hear, like, why did you start learning Chinese? Well, what all happened around that time when you, and, and when okay. was that? Okay, so that's, you know, 1967, I had just joined the Canadian Diplomatic Service, and Canada was getting ready to recognize the People's Republic of China. And so they figured they needed to train up some people in Chinese. I had just graduated from l'Institut d'études politiques in, in Paris, which was all in French. And uh, so I was quite confident that I could learn Chinese. A lot of people didn't think they could do it. So I actually started taking Chinese lessons in Ottawa 
uh, to demonstrate to the management at the Trade Commissioner Service that I was their man. If they wanted someone to speak Ch- to learn Chinese, I, I was the one they wanted to have because I'm already interested. And so why wouldn't they? At that time, we had the Cultural Revolution in China. Someone who had learned in, Ch- in Taiwan wouldn't be welcome back in China in those days. So the choice for me was Hong Kong or Monterey, the Defense Language Institute. And I chose Hong Kong, which, of course, is a totally Cantonese-speaking, or was in those days, purely Cantonese-speaking environment. But at least it was a Chinese environment. So that's where I chose to go and start learning Chinese. So you went to Hong Kong to learn Chinese? Correct. To learn Mandarin. So, I mean, how did you even do that? I mean, at that time, like, how did you find a school and make that move? Well, of course, don't forget, I was employed by the Canadian government. Okay, so they had already hired you at that time. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was hired as a trade commissioner. So, so the other thing to remember is, so let's say there's a group of 25 or 30 people who have been hired by the trade commissioner service, and one third of the postings, the jobs were in the United States, you know. And everybody wanted to avoid being posted to Buffalo or, you know, somewhere not very interesting. <laughs> so uh, I figured if I could uh, demonstrate an interest in Chinese, they might choose me. You know, we all wanted to go to someplace exotic. Then the decision was mine. Do I want to go to Monterey uh, at the Defense Language Institute or do I want to go to Hong Kong? It couldn't be Taiwan because that would have been politically unacceptable to mainland China. And in those days, in the Cultural Revolution environment in China, you couldn't couldn't go there and study Chinese. You know, that was just not going to work. So it was Hong Kong. And there were a number of schools in Hong Kong. I ended up going to the Chinese University of Hong Kong that had a program. But the uh, Hong Kong University had a program. And there again, I chose the Chinese University of Hong Kong located in Kowloon. Well, tell me about then. What were your classes like? Who were you studying with? Well, again, paid for by the government. So I was getting a salary while studying, which is pretty (laughs) ideal (laughs) situation, right? And it was all one-on-one, no classes. And I'm a strong, firm believer in one-on-one. I would never sit in the classroom with other learners. Uh, And so we had three hours uh, a day with, you know, I had three or four different teachers. And uh, they were very much into the sort of drill approach to learning languages. And then I would spend the rest of the day on my own. It was the rest of the day that was really important. Well, before you get into I want to hear, you said the drill approach. What, what do you mean by that? What was that? So the drill, they had these drills where you, you know, you would say, uh, So they would have the basic same sentence and they change mm-hmm. one or two words in the sentence. And that's, oh, there's okay. a lot of drill like that. Uh, particularly in the beginning. Uh, We also had a textbook called uh, Chinese Dialogues. And it was audio and then this silly story that takes place in China. But of course, in those days, we couldn't go to China. So it was almost like science fiction because you're talking about this (laughs) American living in China. There's no American living in China in those days, you know, freely traveling from Shanghai to Beijing. And I think they might have even used the word Beiping in those days. But spoken so fast, I remember saying to myself, are they doing this on purpose to torture us? But of course, (laughs) it wasn't so fast. That's just how they speak. And eventually you get used to it. A lot of listening and reading, a lot of listening and reading. I mean, I literally put in six, seven hours a day. So I had three hours, three hours with my teacher, whatever they forced me to do, which is, is kind of like a bit of an imposition. And then I would go home and I would listen. In those days, we had these sort of open reel tape recorders. And I would sit there in my little room and listen to this stuff over and over and over again and read it. In those days, they didn't have pinyin. They had the Yale system, which is actually very good. It's very good. Actually, very good. And uh, that's what I did. Lots of listening and reading and then sit in class and get uh, drilled. Uh, but eventually, we, I said I didn't want to do the drilling anymore. I just wanted to talk in class. So, you know, they they were very happy to have the Canadian government pay for one-on-one lessons. So they basically agreed to do what I wanted to do. Oh, that's, well, that is nice. That is nice. Yeah. What, what kind of progress were you making at that time? You also kind of hinted at maybe you did some things out of the classroom. I mean, was there anything besides listening? I know you're in Hong Kong, so I, I imagine maybe opportunities are limited. Yeah, you essentially, uh, you might have a few words with uh, someone running a sort of a Shandong restaurant in, in Hong Kong, but essentially no one spoke Mandarin. 
And it was hard to hear Mandarin on, on the radio. And I wouldn't have understood it anyway. No, I did a lot of reading. I worked, obviously, initially, you got to put a lot of effort into the characters. So I would put an hour, at least an hour a day into my characters. But after three months, I could pick my way through a newspaper. And then I, I remember after six or seven months, I read my first novel, which was uh, Lothar Sianza. Oh, wow. I pushed, you know, and I would scour the bookstores. Like, it's important to remember that this is before the online dictionary, before the, all of the wonderful resources that we have now. And so all you had was books with glossaries behind each chapter. I, I, and I refused to look anything up in a Chinese dictionary because it's so time consuming. And as with any dictionary, no sooner have you looked up the word and closed the dictionary, you've already forgotten what was there. So I would only deal with readers where a glossary was attached. So I would just go through, you know, lesson after lesson after lesson. There were a number of good, you know, graded materials like uh, this 20 lectures in Chinese culture. And then there was another one called Intermediate Reader in Chinese. And then Yale has a whole series of Chinese literature, Chinese communist writings, Chinese political writings, all kinds of stuff. So there was a lot of material and there would be new books show up in these bookstores in Hong Kong. And I would be, just as I scour the internet now to find good stuff for Turkish or Persian, uh, in those days, I would scour the bookstores of Hong Kong to find readers with, with glossaries that I could actually use to learn. And if they had audio, that was great, but that was not as common in those days. Well, how long did you have the opportunity to study Chinese in this way? Well, I mean, I went through it as quickly as I could. There were a bunch of diplomat students, Japanese, British, American, Canadian. I think I put more into it than the others. I certainly read more, listened more, and uh, I was done. Like I, after 10 months, I wrote the British Foreign Service exam. We had to write a diplomatic note in Chinese. Handwrite, I presume. Handwrite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there were no <laughs> no computer word processors in those days. You had to handwrite everything. Translate newspaper editorials from English to Chinese, from Chinese into English. I mean, it was quite a demanding uh, exam. And there were other questions on it. And uh, yeah, so 10 months and I had my British Foreign Service Mandarin Chinese certificate or whatever. And I assume this was all in traditional characters at the time. No. We started in traditional and after, I don't know, a couple of months we switched, which wasn't a big deal because the simplified characters do resemble the cursive script and we had to learn the cursive script. So it wasn't, wasn't that big a deal and uh, I'm able to read both. I don't even notice which one I'm reading. It's not a big deal. Well, that's impressive. I still can't read cursive. Oh, yeah. Well, I, have to, I, I can't say that I'm uh, tremendous at cursive, but... But we, that was one of the things we, we, we did was cursive. And of course, some of the simplified characters do resemble the cursive strokes. So what happened after classes then, after you finished the, I guess, your language study? Well, then I uh, went to work for the Canadian Trade Commissioner's office in, in Hong Kong. One of the major activities, uh, f first of all, we had a bunch of Canadian businessmen regularly visit Hong Kong on their way into China. China also had this uh, Canton Trade Fair twice a year. The, the trade fair itself was about a month long and I might go up there for two two-week stints. And typically I would help Canadian business people there sit in on their meetings, help with the uh, interpreting, uh, if I had any background information that might be helpful to them. The other thing that we did is we tried to scour the Chinese press to see if we could learn anything that might be helpful, say, in regards to grain supplies in China, which might influence our wheat sales to China. And we also kept track of uh, the whole uh, cultural revolution, what was happening politically. So I did a lot of reading of, uh, of the Chinese press just to stay on top of what we could learn about the situation in China. And that sounds like it, would be, it was a very interesting time to be in and around China. Oh, yeah, it was very interesting. And, and people don't realize that, you know, you had all these so-called China hands trying to interpret what's going on there. I mean, you couldn't just go into China and travel around. Like, it, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to me now that I can just go into China, go to any hotel, talk to anybody I want, jump in a train. In those days, you'd, I, I didn't go anywhere without someone from Lu Xingxie, you know, from their China travel with me. You weren't free to move around. Although I did, I would uh, rent a sandler, you know, a pedicab and I toured cities and I did talk to some people. 
Well, how did you get into China at the time? Because it was, uh, I guess, a fit, still closed door, if you will. Yeah, well, I was a diplomat. We had the right to send someone to the uh, Canton Trade Fair. And I mean, you had to request. So I would say request. I want to go to Shanghai. or And it was a big deal when they gave you permission. Once we established diplomatic relations, I was with the first uh, group that went to Beijing in October 1970, which was quite extraordinary because it, it was getting cold and the peasants would bring in their cabbage and just dump these mountains of cabbage on the sidewalk. That was their distribution system. And people hmm. would come and presumably pay for the cabbage. I don't know. But, but it was amazing. I can remember in the hotels in Beijing, you could get either red or black caviar for like one yuan, a mountain of caviar, sturgeon wow. caviar or salmon caviar. Uh, it was a different time. And, and it was so cheap to eat. And, and uh, it was amazing, actually. But Cultural Revolution, everybody was dressed very drably. The average living standard was quite low. Have you been back to China, I guess, since your diplomatic days? Oh, yeah. I mean, I traveled there quite often in the 70s. Uh, not much change, although in 1979, all of a sudden in this bar in the Peace Hotel in Shanghai, these uh, older gentlemen, all wearing ties, were playing jazz in the bar. So that was amazing. Hmm. Like you looked at these little indicators that things were loosening up a bit. So uh, I, also I was once in Beijing and maybe in the mid 70s, or maybe it was the early 80s. And these girls from this dance academy came over and there was a dance and we were all allowed to dance with these girls. And they were very nice looking girls, I'll tell you. So that was kind of <laughs> nice. So this was the thaw, right? But then I didn't go back to China for over 20 years. And then when I visited in 2002, I was absolutely amazed. And I've been back three or four times since and I'm amazed every time. How would you describe the change that you've seen in China from, I guess, the 70s till even more the present day? Well, they're at, at various levels. First of all, the, the level that, that you are free to talk to anybody you want. Second of all, that whereas in those days, everyone looked poor and the infrastructure was shabby. Now, some people look rich and some people look poor and they have amazing infrastructure. And in those days, I mean, there was nothing. You didn't, the factories looked very primitive and you sat in the train or even as you walked around the city, you'd be hearing the sort of uh, stirring revolutionary music and there were slogans on the walls and stuff. And today, the only ideology is, there's two right now. One is make money and the second is nationalism, you know, <laughs> but there's no other ideology, you know. It, you know, to jump on a, on a bullet train from Beijing where there's, 15 tracks or more and modern train stations at four or five cities along the way. And as you approach Suzhou or Shanghai, there's massive factories everywhere and, uh, you know, modern highways. It's, it's absolutely, there, there is no one who in the seventies would ever have predicted that one day China would look like that. I recall once I was in Shenzhen with a classmate and he, we went out to dinner in this big kind of open food area and there's restaurants everywhere. And he says, hey, you know, when I was growing up, it's not that nobody could even, you know, afford something like this. He says, this didn't even exist. You know, even if you just wanted to go out, you know, it's just, it wasn't even there. Shenzhen, when I went across in 1969, was a very small fishing village. Hmm. With, uh, I don't know how many people and a few dogs and it was like a sleepy little place. And you walked across the border. There was no no train or traffic that took you into Shenzhen. We were staying in the, the Dongfang Hotel, which was the only hotel for foreign. Like they would all, if you were a Westerner, you stayed in this hotel. If you were a Japanese, you stayed in this other hotel. If you were an overseas Chinese, you stayed in this other hotel. They, you know, everything was segregated. But then we'd go out to there were about four or five Chinese restaurants. You know, obviously Chinese, like restaurants in Guangzhou, very good food. And they all had a special section for their foreigners. And it was very elegant. You walked through an area which was kind of dirty where the locals uh, ate. And then you came to this place and you ate the most fabulous meal for three yuan a head. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. amazing. <laughs> well, thinking back on some of those times you know, when you were learning Chinese, and it sounds like even when you got into your profession there, what, what do you think really helped you uh, improve your proficiency in the language? F first of all, reading. Reading. 
Because I, I believe you have to have a lot of characters. You know, I, I don't know how many characters I can recognize, three or 4,000, enough so that I can read a book. And, and there will be characters that I don't know, but I'm comfortable reading the book. And reading is a tremendous way to increase your vocabulary and to gain familiarity with the language. I find that as you read, you tend to sub-vocalize. So I'm a great believer in the power of reading. That'd be one. And the other is listening. Because the listening, again, it, it prepares you for speaking. And it also gives you momentum for your reading because you want to be able to sub-vocalize. And if you have listened to something a lot, you'll be better at sort of sub-vocalizing as you're reading. I think that probably the other students did a, you know, as much talking as I did, but I did an awful lot more reading and listening. And I listened to stuff. We had this history of the Second World War, for example, uh, which I listened to over and over and over again, always the same parts I couldn't understand. But you're getting the rhythm of the language into you. It was the same with uh, Xiangsheng. I used to, my one of my teachers gave me this Xiangsheng cassette tape, Ho Baolin, who is a very well-known Xiangsheng performer. Mm -hmm. And she thought, oh, it's so funny, it's so funny. And I listened to it and people were laughing. I basically couldn't understand it that well. But there was something about it that I enjoyed. It was almost like music. And I listened to it over and over and over again. I feel like my tones are not bad in Chinese. A lot of people struggle with tones. And I attribute that to the Xiangsheng because they exaggerate mm -hmm. the tones, you know, and they're, and it's very lively. It's very engaging. I mean, you have to listen to stuff that grabs you, that has high resonance. And these Xiangsheng tapes that I listen to uh, over and over and over again while exercising, while whatever, you know, I just listen to them. I wrote the British service exam after one year, and most people struggle to do it after two. Uh, and I attribute that to the sort of, you know, focus on listening and reading. Like I, I have a massive library of Chinese readers that I would buy. If I saw one in the bookstore in Hong Kong, I'd buy it. If there was any audio material, I'd get it. And, and of course, all of this has become so much easier today because you can find it all online. You can download it. And then there's online dictionaries. And just, there's just so many things. It, it's just much easier today than it, was, than it was in those days. So what do you think spurred you uh, like onwards? Because, I mean, a lot of people will learn a language, but maybe they don't you know, work as hard at it or maybe they don't put as much time into it. It sounds like you were really motivated. Um, what do you think was really that source of motivation for you? Well, I think there's two things. First of all, I was being paid like a full salary. So I owed my employer eight hours a day. Uh, you know, I couldn't just go to school for three hours and then go off and <laughs> play tennis or something, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. And the second thing is that language learning, it either the language either grabs you or it doesn't grab you. Chinese, I mean, I was attracted by the idea of, of going to learn Chinese because it's it's such an exotic it was to me at that time. It, I don't consider it so exotic now, but in those days it was like <laughs> exotic, like, wow, China. And as I got into it and I got into the history of China, not only the sort of history of 2000 years ago, but also modern history, the, the 1911, the Qing dynasty now becomes the Republic of China. And then they have the warlords and you have these intellectuals grappling with what should be China's road. And uh, and I enjoyed the 20th century, you know, novelist Lu Xun and, and all these people. I just found it fascinating. You know, it's like, it's if, you, if you're at a feast and you can eat all you want and you're not going to get indigestion, you just keep eating. <laughs> so, you know, what's going to prevent me? I just keep going, keep going, keep going. And if it weren't for the fact that I want to get to know more about other languages and cultures, I got into Russian, I got into, you know, whatever, Korean, uh, and now it's Middle Eastern, Turkish, Arabic, Persian. If, if I weren't chasing these other languages to get a bit of a, of a taste of what those cultures are all about, I would want to get deeper into Chinese because it's, it's endless. It's endless. Get into the history, get into so many different things that I would love to get into in more depth. But obviously, there's only so much time in the day, so. Well, I'm also interested to hear about uh, okay, about Chinese here. You, you learned the language, and it sounds like you developed a, a very uh, good proficiency in the language. Now, how did that impact your life going forward? And, and obviously, I think for our listeners here uh, who may not know much about you, you are proficient in many languages. So I think kind of talk about that. I think, first of all, the fact that I became very fluent in French. So I, I, this experience of, of converting yourself from basically someone who only speaks one language 
to actually being fluent, like genuinely fluent in a second language, it gives you that confidence that you can do it. So therefore, I went and learned Chinese. And then, uh, for a variety of reasons, I ended up going to Japan. So I had no doubt that I could learn Japanese. So I learned Japanese entirely on my own, with the benefit of being able to recognize the characters. The pronunciation certainly is different. The meaning sometimes is different in Japanese. And so I knew that I could do it. I knew how to do it. I had to do a lot of listening and reading. So having learned Chinese helped me learn Japanese. The fact that I learned Japanese opened up opportunities for me in the wood industry because on two different occasions, major Canadian lumber exporting companies hired me to run their operation in Tokyo. And then uh, I got to know the Japanese timber trade very well and eventually set up my own company in 1987, aimed at the Japanese market. And I still have that company, but you never know what's going to lead to what. I always say that. So you've got to do <laughs> something. You have to get off your rear end and do something. You never know quite what it might lead to. Now, my company's main business in the lumber business is importing wood from Europe, which we sell to the U.S. East Coast. We have an office in Florida. Lumber being an international commodity, prices change. And uh, Europe became more competitive. Initially, we were supplying Japan from Europe, and now we're supplying the U.S. East Coast from Europe. It, it, you know, one thing led to another. Well, how did you get into learning all of these other languages? And, and maybe you could rattle off what some of these are. Yeah, well, I mean, if I go in order, more or less in order of proficiency, although in, in some languages I'm better at speaking and some I'm better at reading, but English, French, Japanese, Mandarin, Spanish, then probably German, Swedish. Swedish was very important for my lumber business because we, for a long time, we were buying a lot of wood in Sweden. Mm. Uh, German, Italian, Cantonese, Portuguese, which I don't really speak that well, but if you have Spanish with a minimum of effort, you can learn Portuguese. Mm. Then Russian, which was, so if I look at my language learning, so I had uh, the languages that I learned uh, sort of during my professional career. And then starting 10, say 12, 13 years ago, as we started Link, then I get into the sort of second wave of languages, Korean and then Russian. And I learned Russian because, you know, my approach to language learning is to focus on, on immersing, sort of listening and reading, acquiring vocabulary, and then visiting the grammar. And particularly with Japanese and Chinese, I don't know of any grammar terms for those languages other than I know noun, verb, adjective. But any of mm -hmm. the other, when I pick up some of the books that people use today, and it's full of all these complicated explanations, I, I never referred to those. The basic Four parts of speech, noun, pronoun. Okay, I understand that. Beyond that, I don't use grammar. However, I do at times, like in Chinese, you know, there are patterns, you know. Uh, right? So there are these patterns. And so these are the patterns used in, say, Chinese. This is how we say it in English. This is how we say it in Chinese. That's the extent of, of my sort of reference to grammar. So I was explaining this to someone and they said, ah, oh, yeah, that's fine for Asian languages, which are not that grammar heavy. Some people disagree with that, but, but you couldn't do that for Russian. So I said, oh yeah. <laughs> so then I decided <laughs> to learn Russian. I, when I was 60, I started learning Russian. And so then having learned Russian, then I went and learned Czech and, and Ukrainian and Polish and to some extent Slovak. Obviously there's some lower hanging fruit stuff happening there. So, and then I, because we, we buy a lot of wood in Romania, I had to go visit Romania. So then I learned Romanian, which is not that difficult because a lot of the vocabulary is identifiable from other Romance languages. And then we, uh, my wife and I were going to be in Crete. So I decided to learn uh, Greek. And then I said, you know, I don't know much about the Middle East. So um, why not learn Arabic? And then I said, geez, if I've learned the Arabic script, there's so many uh, Iranians here in Vancouver, I should really learn Persian because mm -hmm. I can't, there's no one, I don't run into people who speak Arabic here, but I run into people who speak Persian. And then uh, my wife started watching Turkish serials on Netflix. So I got interested in Turkish. <laughs> like anything can trigger the interest. It doesn't matter. The, w once you're, the, the interest is triggered, then the language itself becomes the attraction. And mm -hmm. you just want to get into more and more of the language. I, I find languages fascinating. I find how Turkish works to be fascinating, as was Chinese way back when. It's nice to hear this uh, idea of that getting interest in the language. To me, it sounds like that is your motivation now, is the interest in actually learning and connecting. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I have no need to learn Turkish. <laughs> 
And also, I'm going to back you up a little bit on the, the concept of not studying grammar. I, that's something right. we always hear from, uh, you know, learners or teachers might say, oh, you got to learn the grammar. But, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the more forward thinking and the research in second language acquisition says, you know, don't study grammar. You, know, you can be aware of it. There may be some points, maybe, a, you know, a clarification or studying up on maybe at times, but teaching grammar is largely ineffective. That's it. You get more benefit from just practicing, learning, and seeing those patterns again and again. Exactly. See, the idea that you got to learn the basics first is completely wrong. And I, I don't care who uh, tells me that, no, I like learning grammar and I learned the basics first. I don't believe that. I simply don't believe it. It's impossible to learn the basics first. It's impossible to see this theoretical explanation of the language. All of those explanations only make sense once you have had enough experience with the language so that you have something to refer to. So that to me, it begins with listening and reading simple stories, simple material. Obviously, it needn't be completely brain dead stuff. It needn't be, hello, how are you? You know, or a lot of these books, they start out with, uh, you know, you're at the train station, you're going through passport control at the airport, like totally unrealistic scenarios. It can be anything. It, I went and had a cup of coffee. I met Joe. We talked about this, that, and the other. It can be anything almost, but shorter and uh, an emphasis on the most common verbs, I think is very important. And start listening and reading. And of course, now you have you know programs like Link. You can look words up. You can create flashcards. You can review them and you start to get a toehold in the language. Once you have experienced the language, you now become curious What does this really mean? I see all these words, but I can't really make sense of it. Or how does this pattern work? I've seen it a few times. At that point, you can look up a grammar issue. So you can do that if you have a beginner book, a teach yourself or whatever, and you're going through their material, they might offer some explanation. Or you just Google. I Google Turkish verbs, find a good site, print it out, sit there, and I read through a bit of a summary of Turkish verbs. Forget it because I won't remember much of it, but I can refer mm-hmm. to it again and again. So grammar is a bit of sort of a reference thing you have at your side, but it's not something, in my view, that can be taught up front. Your mm-hmm. brain has to get used to the language. I would agree with that. I would absolutely agree with that. Well, Steve, also, I'm something I'm, I'd be interested to, to hear from your perspective. Knowing what you know now, if you could right. go back in time and talk to yourself when you were first starting to learn the language, well, what would you tell yourself? Uh, you know what? I, I don't think I'd do anything very different because I, the idea of listening and reading is, is so obvious because certainly when I was doing Chinese, very quickly we were into interesting stuff, whether it was politics in the mainland or ancient history of China. There was um, obvious interest in pursuing that approach to language learning. And I just think that's the correct thing to do. The only thing that would be different today is that it's so much easier. I don't have to fight my way through like Typically in those days, okay, so I'm reading a lesson in this reader that I have, and whether it's literature or history or whatever, and I go through their glossary for each chapter. And of course, half the words on that list I know, half of the words that I don't know from the text are not on their glossary list. So it's a very hit and miss situation. Plus, I have to constantly flip back and forth from the text to the glossary to see if the word that I don't know is on their list. Uh, And then it's still just a list. Whereas today, I can be reading text. I can pull something in from a newspaper. I can look up every word in an online dictionary. If I'm on link, I can save that to a database, which I can review. (laughs) Netflix, I'm sure there's Netflix movies in Chinese. I can get on Netflix in Turkish. Yeah, there's a list of those. Yeah, I can get the Turkish and English subtitles. I can go through frame by frame using my keyboard, the arrow keys on my computer. I can download the transcript, import it into Link. I can find video, songs or whatever, movies on YouTube. And with our Link browser extension, I can import the whole thing into Link as a lesson, go through the text. Even in languages like Persian, the amount of stuff I was able to find. It's so much easier today in terms of the availability of resources, the availability of grammar resources online, the availability of online tutors. It's just that it's so much easier to learn languages today than it was uh, 50 odd years ago. But the method is essentially the same. So what kind of advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese today? First of all, realize that you are dealing with a very rich culture, 
history, a, a fascinating world that's actually quite different from ours. For the longest time, there wasn't very much contact between Rome or Europe or whatever, Middle Ages, and China. So there's a whole world there to discover. And it's also whatever it is, 22% of humanity. So you've got to allow that to get you excited. Then the second thing I would say is invest a lot of time in the characters because uh, reading is a big part of learning. Now, I know there are people who learn to just speak by listening and, and who can manage, but it's so much easier to acquire vocabulary when you can read. If you can read, then you can see how so much vocabulary in Chinese consists of different characters arranged in different ways. And so actually vocabulary acquisition in Chinese is easier than in many languages because of the characters. So once you overcome the obstacle of actually learning the characters, your vocabulary can grow quite quickly. You know, recognize what a fascinating world you're about to discover. Two, invest in the characters. And then three, of course, the other big stumbling block in Chinese is the tones. And there I would say you can look at the sort of individual tone for each individual character. But it's very hard to remember that when you're speaking. So you, mm -hmm. have to, you have to learn in phrases, chunks of phrases. You have to listen a lot. Listen a lot. And I found listening to Xiang Chong very good because they tend to exaggerate. And then you have to trust yourself. And trust yourself when you speak and don't try to second guess what's the tone of this and what's the tone of that. Just let yourself go. And uh, that would be my th those three things, I guess. And don't spend too much on the fancy grammar terms that have been invented <laughs> to confuse people about Chinese. Chinese grammar is the easiest grammar of any language that I've learned, and I've been at 20 languages. It's very difficult to make a, a grammatical mistake in Chinese. It's the polar opposite of the Slavic languages. And, and I don't know Georgian or Finnish or other even more complicated grammars, but, but Chinese is very easy. I also like to hear from your perspective on the difficulty right. of Chinese in comparison to other languages. Now, I'm not just going to say difficulty for you, but just in right. general, you have you have a very, uh, I guess, a, a good knowledge of many languages. So how do you think Chinese is difficulty in compared to others? Well, every language has its difficulty. In the case of Chinese, obviously, you have to learn all the vocabulary because there is no common vocabulary. I mean, I'm talking from the point of view of an English speaker or even a speaker of a European language. So you've got to learn all the vocabulary. There's no freebies. If you're an English speaker learning French, 50% of the vocabulary is already known to you, more or less. So that's not the case in Chinese. And the characters, that's a major stumbling block. That's a question of time. You have to do it every day. And, and I put in an hour a day. You know, I used to use these uh, flashcards and I would write them out by hand. And if I uh, went at 30 new characters a day, I knew ahead of time that I would forget half of them by tomorrow. And so I had to keep on reshuffling these characters into my deck. So that it, that's just a lot of time and effort. But if you get sort of a toehold on it and then you start reading things of interest and you start seeing these characters over and over again, it's like anything else. We have to trust the fact that our brains, with enough exposure, with enough stimulus, our brain learns. That's what the brain is set up to do, learn. So the characters is a major problem and the tones are a problem. Uh, another problem in Chinese too is when you go to China, there's so many regional pronunciations and sometimes comprehension can be a problem in Chinese. There's so many homonyms in Chinese, so comprehension can be a problem. But on the other hand, the grammar is, is very easy, very straightforward. I'd also like to hear from your perspective. So I would say on the that because of the, the characters, but even the tones, you know, any language you speak, you got to get a, a, a feel for the intonation of that language. So really, the, the obstacle is the characters. And that's a question of time. Chinese other than that, I don't think Chinese is particularly difficult. That's actually nice to hear your perspective on that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm never concerned that I'm going to make a mistake when I speak Chinese. Whereas when you're speaking, say, a Slavic language, you're forever second guessing yourself on the case endings. And even in speaking a Romance language, you're second guessing yourself on the gender. Whereas in Chinese, you can't get it wrong. You can say it in five different ways and it's still OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Uh, well, Steve, I really appreciate you being on our show. This is Steve Kaufman, the linguist. Right. And if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Well, I have a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve, all right, L-I-N-G-O Steve, 
Uh, I have a blog, which is www.thelinguist.com. Obviously, together with my son, Mark, we created a language learning platform community website called link, L-I-N-G-Q dot com. And I hang out there on the forum, occasionally uh, teach English there online, and I'm busy there learning languages like Turkish and Persian and so forth. And we offer some 33 languages, including Mandarin, of course, and Cantonese, by the way. Well, Steve, I really appreciate it. This has been really insightful, uh, and I really appreciate you sharing your perspective with everyone. Thank you, Jared. Nice talking to you. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, pilot, fisher, swimmer, snake handler, therapist, diver, artist, guru, composer, and that one guy named Spencer. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook or at ManorCompanion.com or tag us on social media. Hashtag ManorCompanion. Apologies to John Cena. We just ran out of time. The you Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is Kaiser Kuo. And I'd like to thank our special guest, Steve Kaufman, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazden. See you next time.